Funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. Good evening and thanks for joining us this Thursday night. I'm Brianna Venosi. You can smoke it, vape it, or even eat it all legally now in New Jersey. The recreational cannabis market is officially open for business. The first dispensaries opened this morning to long lines that formed well before dawn. Eager pot buyers hoping to be among the first in the state to say they were there when. The legal market is the culmination of years of political battles and grassroots efforts. What can you buy? Well, if you're 21 and older, up to an ounce of cannabis for recreational use, up to five grams of concentrates, resins, or oils, and up to 100 milligrams of edibles. It's still illegal to drive under the influence of marijuana, and you can't bring legal cannabis across state lines. But at long last, residents told senior correspondent Brenda Flanagan they can get high on their own supply. I've been smoking since 1960, and I've been waiting my whole life for today. So 81-year-old Phil McDonald got in the long line at Zenleaf, a cannabis dispensary in Elizabeth, and shared stoner stories while waiting to shop for legal weed. He's always enjoyed a joint or two. I've been smoking all along, you know, but now, after being busted a few times over the years, now I can do it legal. I, it, it's hard to really comprehend what this day is. I'm excited. I felt like a kid at Christmas last night. Really? Yes, finally. Not ostracized for something that's better than alcohol. Sales at Zenleaf moved slowly as shoppers savored the selection. They could buy bud, oils, gummies. Prices ran 45 to 60 bucks for an eighth of an ounce here. The cash flowed. No credit cards for an industry selling products still considered contraband by the feds. As Jersey joined 17 other states, plus the nation's capital, legalizing recreational weed. The Cannabis Regulatory Commission so far authorized 13 dispensaries with more to come. I did not see this day coming, I have to be honest. Why? I, lawmakers, uh, the usual garbage that goes on. I just didn't think it would ever happen. I didn't think anyone would agree to it. Dispensaries can sell one ounce of product per customer per day. Zenleaf says it's got plenty on hand to meet demand without impacting supplies for medicinal clients. We built out for our facility for adult use for the volume that we expected to see in adult use. We have plenty of supply um, um, to, uh, to service the, uh, the folks here today and throughout, uh, throughout the state of New Jersey as we sell products to other stores as well. Zenleaf couldn't estimate how much product it would sell today. The line moved slowly. Over at Ascend in Rochelle Park, customers could line up only after making an appointment as the dispensary worked to control traffic. They anticipated 1,500 to 2,000 shoppers today. We know what it's like to see a state go from medical to adult use. We know what works, we know what doesn't. Um, and I don't think customers really want to wait in three or four hour lines. All of the dispensaries must give precedence to medicinal clients providing separate counters, special hours and home delivery. It's big and it's complicated and getting here took years of contentious political debate, a 2020 referendum giving the thumbs up to light up, plus two more years of wrangling regulations. You saw all the fits and starts. This was an impossible task at some point. So congratulations to all of you for getting this done. Senate President Nick Scatari championed legal weed almost two decades ago. Governor Murphy made it a campaign promise. They toured Zen Leaf today and the governor called the new cannabis industry an economic engine that could generate two billion dollars in sales over the next four years. The legal adult use cannabis industry will not only be an engine of our future economic growth but of our ongoing efforts to ensure economic and social equity and justice and to undo the decades of damage to our communities 
from the failed war on drugs. Even as they shopped, people felt the weight of history being made, the cultural shift, and emotions ran high among minorities long targeted during the war on drugs. It's been a long time coming for this to come, you know, legalizing marijuana. Darnell Davis felt it, watching folks freely purchasing what only a few years ago would have gotten them locked up. It felt like a release. That's definitely a plus, especially me, an African-American male. You know, we, we look over our shoulder and get nervous every time a cop passes us. So this is just one thing that we don't have to feel that, okay, I, I'm shaking in my boots. We're just sitting there talking about getting pulled over for it, getting arrested for it, and everything of that nature. And it stays on your record. So these now are. You can things. get that expunged. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's what we were just talking about. We're going to go try to get that thing expunged off our record. For now, the cannabis industry is still dominated by corporations, but more licenses are in the works targeting minorities and women, folks from disadvantaged neighborhoods. It's a business that's got a lot of growing to do. In Elizabeth, I'm Brenda Flanagan, NJ Spotlight News. Yeah, as Brenda mentioned, one of the main arguments for creating an adult use recreational market was the chance to wipe clean decades of criminal records for those previously convicted of marijuana related offenses. More than 360,000 New Jersey residents saw it happen automatically. But as senior writer Colleen O'Day reports, there are still plenty of people in the state who've been unable to clear their name. Colleen joins us now. So, Colleen, talk to me about this. How many cases are backlogged? How backlogged is the system right now? So, unfortunately, we don't know how many cases are backlogged. Um, the, the courts can't estimate that. Uh, we only know that lawyers uh, are saying that there are many, many folks out there who had thought that their cases would be automatically expunged. Um, and then, you know, we're, we're dismayed to find out that didn't happen. The, the law permitted for automatic expungement only of certain offenses, so fairly simple ones, uh, simple possession, distribution of less than one ounce, which is, depending, I guess, on, on where you stand on this, um, advocates say is not a, a large amount. Um, you know, also possession of paraphernalia. So, so those very simple cases were expunged uh, last fall, about 362,000 of them. But anyone who had a case that, that fell beyond that, you know, where there might have been other charges attached to it, um, did not have a case expunged. So if you're one of those folks who thought, hey, my record's going to be automatically cleared, what happens now? Do you have any appeals in this process? What can you do? So you go to court, um, you can make a petition and ask a judge to see this. The, the problem, though, is that before any county prosecutor will uh, allow this to go before a judge, they want to hear from the state police, which does you know, a review of the case. And we're told that it is at that level, um, the state police level, where there's, there's a huge backlog. Um, state police did not get back to us to say, specifically why, whether it's, you know, a manpower issue, whether it's too many cases, maybe a, a combination of both. But um, we're told, and, and this is this is certainly, a, you know, a concern for those with these charges, but it's also for anyone who may be looking to have any, any um, you know, past crime expunged. Um, there, we're told there's a backlog of between nine months and a year to wow. get something like this heard. So, I mean, when you talk to advocates, folks who were really, you know, pushing the social justice element of this, do they feel like it's been achieved or, or about to be? Where do they stand? Well, so, you know, uh, certainly it's not achieved yet for many people. Um, you know, as they point out, uh, it can be very difficult to get a job when you have a drug conviction in your past. Uh, we have a new law that says, you know, you, you can't be denied housing, but th there's still a question about how well that's working. So a drug conviction can also hurt you in terms of, of housing. So whether that's been achieved yet, you know, it's going to be, it's going to take more time until all of these cases, I think, can, can make their way through the courts and everyone can get an expungement, everyone who deserves it. And then, of course, now folks being able to purchase this legally, um, I'd imagine that there's going to be quite a bit of uproar about that now that the market's actually launched. Right, right. And that was the whole reason for this automatic expungement was because now that this is legal and, and it's decriminal, it's depending on how much you have, it's either decriminalized or, or legal outright. Um, you know, anyone with a past offense should not be 
um, you know, should not be penalized for that. And so, you know, the, the courts had wanted to get these wiped away before the legalization took effect, but obviously that hasn't completely happened. All right, Colleen O'Day for us tonight. Thanks so much, Colleen. Thank you, Brianna. For all your cannabis questions, like where to purchase or how the new market works and your legal rights, check out our post on njspotlightnews.org. A dire situation at the bombed-out steel plant in Ukraine's southeastern port city, Mariupol, where thousands of Ukrainian soldiers and civilians are holed up dying underground, according to military officials, with nearly no food, no water or medical supplies left, holding out against a much larger Russian force. Russian President Vladimir Putin today claiming success and victory in Mariupol while canceling plans to storm the steel plant, instead ordering his troops to block the plant so that, quote, even a fly can't get through. Ukrainian President Volodymyr Zelensky estimates roughly 120,000 residents are still trapped in the besieged city, accusing Russia of blocking humanitarian corridors for civilians to safely escape. President Biden this morning said it was questionable, though, whether Russia does in fact control Mariupol, pledging another $800 million in military assistance to Ukraine, including heavy artillery, tactical drones, and ammunition. As Ukraine enters what he calls a critical window of the war, announcing another $500 million in economic assistance to help Ukraine's government and a new program, Unite for Ukraine, to expedite legal migration for refugees seeking to come to the U.S., vowing that President Putin would, quote, never succeed in dominating and occupying all of Ukraine. The Battle of Kyiv was a historic victory for the Ukrainians. It was a victory for freedom won by the Ukrainian people with unprecedented assistance by the United States and our allies and our partners. Now, now we have to accelerate that assistance package to help prepare Ukraine for Russia's offensive that's going to be more limited in terms of geography, but not in terms of brutality, not in terms of brutality. Meanwhile, the Biden administration is appealing a federal court ruling overturning the mask mandate for passengers on public transportation after the CDC found the rule was necessary to protect public health from the coronavirus. But the appeal doesn't change the removal of the mask mandate for now. That would require a request for a stay of the judge's ruling. The White House saying the decision to appeal was also an effort to preserve the CDC's authority moving forward should the pandemic worsen. Across New Jersey today, cases spiked, more than 2,300 reported and seven more deaths. We now know the toll COVID has taken on people both physically and mentally. The World Health Organization reports a 25 percent increase in the prevalence of depression and anxiety worldwide during just the first year of the pandemic alone, referring to the study as a wake-up call to step up mental health services and support. As Raven Santana reports, New Jersey is heeding the warning. Learning how to identify what is actual sadness and what is true depression. And I think that's something that people miss. Fran Gervasi lost her oldest son by suicide 30 years ago, right before he turned 18. Gervasi says he was diagnosed with adolescent depression six years before he took his life. Now, when people try to access the services, a lot of times they don't know how to. Gervasi is now on a mission to make sure those thinking about suicide, especially teens, have the support they need here in Jersey. Gervasi joined Representative Mikey Sherrill, staff from the Mental Health Association of Essex and Morris, and other panelists for a suicide prevention roundtable discussion. The news is not all good in New Jersey because our youth suicide rate continues to increase, the suicide rate among the elderly continues to increase, and the suicide rate among adolescent girls continues to increase and the suicide rate among uh, young African-American boys continues to increase. During the event, the Congresswoman discussed the importance of direct federal funding being secured for suicide prevention among adolescents. A check for $300,000 was presented to the Mental Health Association of Essex and Morris, which was part of funding that she championed for the state. This particular grant is really directed at teen suicide awareness. So trying to get to young people before um, the worst happens. Like trying to make sure there's awareness, that there's education, that teens know who to go to, a trusted adult, if they're having thoughts of suicide. And parents I spoke with here say access to services and resources is one of the biggest challenges when it comes to preventing suicide. 
So we went to the pediatrician. They just gave us a list of people, which is a stock, you know, list of numbers. You keep doing every every all the research online, but it's all online. It doesn't really help you when there is crisis. Shilpil Kulkarni's son Shiv lost his battle with major depressive disorder on July 29th, 2021 at age 14. She says Shiv, like others who struggle with depression, internalized it so much it was hard to understand or even tell that he was in pain. The same pain Wendy Sefcik says she experienced when she lost her son TJ to suicide 11 years ago and has now made it her mission to educate others after saying the signs and symptoms for suicide in teens can be easily missed. That's the problem is at a time when you're in crisis because you're worried about a loved one who's talking about suicide, we don't go to the normal people that we would go to because of the stigma. So many individuals who die by suicide have actually seen their primary care practitioner within 30 days of dying by suicide. All three moms are now hoping the funding will help raise awareness on where to go when families or individuals find themselves in a crisis. Still health professionals say the best way to overcome the stigma of mental health is to be aware, not scared, of the signs and symptoms. And then we want to ask the question directly. Um, are you thinking about suicide? And this is one of the greatest myths when it comes to suicide is that people feel like, well, I can't ask that question because it's going to put that idea in their head. And that's absolutely not true. By asking that question, we allow someone to talk about some scary stuff that they might be feeling. For NJ Spotlight News, I'm Raven Santana. Ahead of Earth Day, taking a stand for environmental justice. Residents in the Ironbound neighborhood in Newark are demanding that the Passaic Valley Sewerage Commission scrap a plan to build a gas-powered plant in the community, making it the fourth fossil fuel power plant in the neighborhood, which is also home to an incinerator, Superfund site, heavy diesel truck traffic from nearby Port Newark and Elizabeth. Now health experts and local leaders are raising their voices opposing the plan and what they call the pollution burden it'll bring. Ted Goldberg reports. People in the Ironbound are protesting a possible fourth power plant in their neighborhood. The Passaic Valley Sewerage Commission wants to build a gas plant there despite more than 100 health professionals sending a letter to Governor Murphy opposing it. They're not convinced the plant will be environmentally safe. The burden of proof is on someone, uh, a polluter essentially, or someone who's going to create pollution to prove that uh, it's not going to be having an added deleterious effect on the community. I still think they need to do more. I still think they need to sit down face to face and say, look, we're not going to do anything else until we have these intimate discussions with residents and with the groups like Ironbound Community Corporation. Sheets says this is the first big test for New Jersey's environmental justice law, which Murphy signed in 2020. It gives the Department of Environmental Protection the power to deny pollution permits to facilities that have a disproportionate negative impact on what's considered an overburdened community. The Ironbound is considered an overburdened community, but the technical rules for enforcing the law still have not been written. So people in Newark are stuck in limbo. This law is supposed to protect communities of color and low income communities from excessive levels of pollution. Communities like the one we're standing in now. The law is going to go into effect very soon. We're waiting for regulations to be issued. A community is considered overburdened if 40% of its residents are minorities or if 35% of its households are low income. Environmental justice, you know, incorporates not only race, but class and the social association, the correlation between the SMA amount of pollution and the race and the income of residents is um, what unacceptable. Others in Newark are protesting by counting the trucks driving illegally through parts of their city. Transportation is the state's largest source of air pollution and trucks in the ironbound make it harder to breathe. This street right here is not a truck route and we have cars that are coming up and down this this corridor and right behind us or right next to me is the community center. Rodriguez says that Newark can't take another power plant. The PVSC has previously said it's committed to working with community groups to minimize impact. They're hosting a virtual public hearing next week. With Newark, we are faced with so many, you know, polluting industries, whether it's the airport, 
the trucks that are coming by, you know, the Passaic Valley Sewage Facility, which is one of the biggest sewage facilities on the east coast, on, on this part of the coast, as well as Covanta, which is the garbage incinerator. So adding all that together is, you know, it's affecting us, right? If you live in a community near industry, near highways, near facilities, it's much more likely that you're breathing unhealthy air and the health effects are gonna be shown, whether we're talking about asthma attacks, uh, heart attacks, other cardiovascular issues, that that exposure to those uh, sources are absolutely raised and we need to do more to fight air pollution, especially in those communities. The American Lung Association released its state of the air report today. And while it was good news for most of New Jersey, Essex County, where the Ironbound District sits, was the state's only county to record an increase in ground level smog over the last three years. More evidence for residents who say enough is enough. In Newark, I'm Ted Goldberg, NJ Spotlight News. For a deeper dive into the annual American Lung Association's air quality report and the impact on communities of color, check out Tom Johnson's reporting at njspotlightnews.org. Well, it seems everyone is vying for a piece of the pie, and so budget season goes. Rhonda Schaffler has the latest on state house hearings and tonight's top headlines. Hey, Rhonda. Brianna, the road to a new state budget takes time, and lawmakers continue to gather input on how New Jersey should allocate its revenue. Today, the Senate Budget Committee heard from members of the public, giving everyone three minutes to state their requests. There were calls for more funding for education, child care, and programs to help low-income residents. Citizen Action testified that more money was needed for programs providing rent, mortgage, and utility assistance. There was a request for more funding for University Hospital as well as other health care programs, a call to increase funding for security grants awarded to faith-based organizations facing bias threats and incidents. And there was also a request for stable funding for the arts. Budget hearings continue next week. A heated hearing in Washington, D.C. today as the head of the IRS went before a House subcommittee. IRS Commissioner Charles Reddick was peppered with questions during the oversight hearing, lawmakers asking why wealthy people aren't paying their fair share of taxes, and demanded to know why it's taking the IRS so long to get out refunds. The commissioner said the agency is trying to work through a backlog of claims. In the aggregate, it's right around 5 million paper returns. And we have gone to an all hands on deck uh, area there. We brought in, I think you've heard about surge teams, which are experienced people coming back in to process those returns. We're hiring contractors. We're doing literally everything we can. Meantime, the IRS says it's taking up to three to four months to issue refunds for tax returns with the recovery rebate credit, earned income tax credit, and additional child tax credit. A new $40 million redevelopment project has been announced in Patterson. A century-old silk mill is being renovated into a mixed-use development that will include apartments. The Great Falls Lofts Project is located next to Hinchcliffe Stadium and Great Falls National Historic Park. As COVID cases ease, we're traveling again, and airlines are saying they're seeing strong demand. United, which has a major hub in Newark, says it expects to turn a profit this year for the first time since before the pandemic. Now, here's a check on today's stock market action. I'm Rhonda Schaffler, and those are your top business stories. Support for the Business Report provided by NJCU School of Business, a game-changing force offering programs like financial technology or business analytics and data science. We're steps away from the Exchange Place Path Train in Jersey City and minutes from Wall Street. Learn more at njcu.edu slash gamechanger. And join Rhonda Schaffler for NJ Business Beat this weekend and a look at the business behind our furry best friends, including why pets are proving to be inflation proof and how New Jersey will play a key role in training the next generation of veterinarians. Watch it Saturday morning at 10 a.m. on the NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel.
And that does it for us tonight. But tune in tomorrow morning to Reporters Roundtable with senior political correspondent David Cruz. Tomorrow is Earth Day, and David talks with Ed Potasnik, executive director of the New Jersey League of Conservation Voters, about top environmental concerns in the state and, of course, the upcoming plastic bag ban, plus a panel of local reporters talking all the big political headlines of the week. That's Friday morning at 10 a.m. on the NJ Spotlight News YouTube channel. I'm Brianna Vanozzi. For the entire team, thanks for being with us tonight. We'll see you back here tomorrow. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years, and by the PSEG Foundation. Orsted will provide renewable offshore wind energy, jobs, educational, supply chain, and economic opportunities for the Garden State. Orsted, committed to the creation of a new, long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. Online at us.orsted.com. Our future relies on more than clean energy. Our future relies on empowered communities, the health and safety of our families and neighbors, of our schools and streets. The PSEG Foundation is committed to sustainability, equity, and economic empowerment. Investing in parks, helping towns go green, supporting civic centers, scholarships, and workforce development that strengthen our community.